Welcome, my name is Schumann Bassar, and this is the essential Michael Rakowitz. It's another way to approach Michael's exhibition at the Jamil Art Center in Dubai. We were meant to have done this in person uh, a number of months ago, but you all know what happened. So the first part of this, uh, this part right now, is pre-recorded. Afterwards, uh, Michael and I will tune in to take your questions. Uh, the way that you do this is type your questions into the Zoom chat window, and we will do our best to field as many as we can uh, afterwards. I'd like to thank Nora, Lana, Antonia, and Brent, and of course, Michael. So normally at this point, I would uh, ask you all to turn your phones off, but if you're watching this on your phone, please keep them on. Um, and for those of you who are new to this series, let me say a few words about how The Essential came about. There's something about the forward passage of time that opens up the past in ever renewing ways. What might have been experienced at first as random events and encounters reveal their secret codes, their underlying patterns. Instead of chaos, you now realize there was in fact narrative purpose. Epiphany. Uh, an epiphany from the ancient Greek, uh, which I can't uh, necessarily pronounce very well, uh, epiphania, uh, is a manifestation, a striking appearance, uh, and an experience of a sudden and striking realization. So increasingly, I began to have epiphanies about my own um, epiphanies earlier on in my life, such as a title from a painting that taught me how to arrange words, a line from a song that gave me stage directions about desire, or a scene from a film that told me how to live. I always loved the verbal formulation, the essential, the essential Billy Idol, the essential Beethoven, the essential Luther Van Dross. It would be a collection of their best known or best loved hits. But there is also a different way to define the essential. It's by asking someone to share the foundations of what they do, how they think, and the pivot points that got them to where that is. What if you ask them to list, list the books, the films, the albums, the interviews, the essays, and anything else that proved formative in their own making, and which they'd pass on to future generations to discover anew? It's less concerned with historical canons. The essential is, therefore, more like an open syllabus annotated with autobiographical asides. And since influences pass through time like gravitational waves, the essential becomes an intimate occasion to be inspired by inspiration itself. Now, onto our guest uh, today. Michael Rakowitz was born in uh, 1973 and lives and works in Chicago. He is the 2020 laureate of the Nasher Prize for Sculpture in recognition of his vision of sculpture's possibilities in the face of political and humanitarian crises. I first encountered Michael's work in the 2007 Sharjah Biennial. It was, I believe, the first iteration of the Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, where artifacts stolen from the National Museum in Iraq in the aftermath of the US invasion of 2003 have subsequently been reconstructed by Michael and his collaborators using packaging of Middle Eastern foodstuffs and local newspapers. It was a work that was full of pathos, sadness, but also importantly, uh, optimism and hope. Michael consumes stories and tells stories through the things that he makes, the dinners he cooks, and the teaching that he's been dedicated to for such a long time. So will you please uh, give a round, uh, a, a round of applause uh, and a big welcome to Michael Rakovitz. Thank you, Shimon, for that lovely introduction. And I'm too 
proud uh, to call you a friend. So um, this is a pleasure to be here with you today. Thanks, Michael. No, I'm, I'm so glad we're able to do this um, in um, not circumstances that any of us had planned, uh, but we're doing it nevertheless. And, um, and it's great that that is the case. So before we get started uh, with your essential list, Michael, I just won wondered uh, whether the list was uh, something that came easily or difficult, difficultly to you. Um, I always ask the guests to put together a kind of handful, it's not a specific number, but a handful of these touch points from their lives. Um, so I'm curious um, what the process was like for you. Um, surprisingly, it was quite easy. That might be because I've been in psychoanalysis for about six years now, and these all seem to be primal scenes in terms of how uh, I'm, I'm becoming. And so this is, um, in a way it, it, it was, it was actually quite, quite clear. And of course it mm -hmm. could be a list that expands be, beyond the time frame we have here. But for me, these are the most crucial and it was, it was actually a pleasure to be able to, to list them and to be able to have a platform through which we can discuss them. And am I right in thinking these have been arranged chronologically as they occur to you in your life? I think so. It's quite possible that, yes, I believe they are, but let's yeah. see, maybe, and, and that'll be interesting if it's not chronological because I'm a big fan of the postmodern uh, novel. <laughs> as are you and and so this opportunity to constantly have multiple timelines moving in and out of each other is is kind of the the work that i that i try to make wonderful so we're going to start with something that happened in 1980 so let's start with uh, a, a little video clip and uh and then we can talk about it afterwards Good evening. Millions of people mourned the tragic death of John Lennon today. The young and the middle-aged shared a sense of grief over the inexplicable slaying of Lennon, murdered by a young man who'd been a fan of Lennon and the Beatles for the last 15 years. The killing took place last night as Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, were entering their Manhattan apartment house called the Dakota. Crowds gathered soon after and many just stayed outside. Stephen Fraser reports. So this is a word that's going to come up, uh, I believe. And there's another clip which actually, in a non-chronological way, we now go back in time. So Michael, maybe you can give a little context about what we just saw, please. Uh, well, what you saw in the first clip was the news broadcast of uh, the, the announcement of the murder of John Lennon on December 8th, 1980 in New York City. And this was a clip that for me kind of opened up, um, a, 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 as I've said before, a kind of primal scene in the way that I understood art and its possibilities. And the reason I say that is I was seven years old at the time um, and I saw my mother uh, suddenly weeping in front of the television and... Uh, she was grieving in a way that I hadn't seen since my grandfather from Iraq had passed away. And on the TV, I saw that there were people who had gathered and were almost shutting down a street. And it seemed to me like a demonstration or something like that, but they were singing and they all seemed very somber. Some were holding candles and I asked my mother, why was she crying? And she said, John Lennon was killed. And I said, who was John Lennon? And she said, he was in the Beatles. And I said, who are the Beatles? And my mother looked at me like I was an alien. 
And so she promptly took me by the hand, brought me upstairs to my parents' bedroom. She put me sitting on the bed, uh, took a record off the shelf, put it onto the turntable, handed me the cover, which was wild and the most colorful thing I'd seen. It was Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And then the needle came down onto the vinyl. She sat down next to me and she flipped over to the, to the back of the cover, which had all the lyrics. And she said, it's a story from the first word of the first song to the last word of the last song. And that was it. I was hooked. I was in second grade at the time. And this was the point in elementary school where you start to learn about stories and you start to recite poetry as well. So there were students who were reciting Shel Silverstein poems and I was memorizing Beatles lyrics and I would get up there and recite in front of the class. I want to be your lover, baby. I want to be your man. Love you like no other baby, like no other can. And, and I understood that they had changed everything, that they had this impact on art, but, on not, but also on culture and on the way that we saw ourselves as part of a longer vector of history and saw ourselves in social movements and in political movements. And it showed me, showed me everything that art can be. And Yoko was a part of that too. So for me, when I look at this video, I kind of see it as the inverse of the Ed Sullivan clip that you just showed afterwards, which introduced America to the Beatles on the heels of what was a very sad time for the country, which was the aftermath of the Kennedy assassination. And this moment where a lot of people felt as though uh, that, that moment of grace and innocence that somehow characterized the myth of the United States had suddenly moved into a more unknown and uh, precarious time period. And so for me, that was the moment I, this was a moment of martyrdom and I did become a fanatic and a follower. And so for me, it performed that same function that the Ed Sullivan clip did on America where it, it, it was the moment that, that completely changed the way that, that people experienced music uh, and, and saw it as something that was not separate from, from life, but it was actually a moment where art became life. Perhaps it's worth um, mentioning here for those people that don't know this detail that the person that um, shot uh, John Lennon, uh, Mark David Chapman, um, was, well, claimed he had been inspired by another story, which is the catcher in the rye. Yeah. And so it's, it's extra, there's something extraordinary here where one form of culture uh, becomes the catalyst. You could say the, uh, it lights the fuse um, for the end of another cultural icon. And I feel like that, that will come back to something like that um, when we talk about Don DeLillo later on, because I feel like many of the things you're going to introduce to us are somehow captured in this parenthesis between the Beatles arriving and then Lennon being shot. Um, we're gonna keep things moving on, um, Michael, because we've got a few things to get through. Um, oh yeah, we just wanted to, could you say something about these very quickly perhaps? Yes, these are on view at the Jamil Art Center in the exhibition that, that Nora Razian beautifully curated and so there's this room dedicated to a project called the breakup wherein an invitation from jack prosecchian who is the director of al mamal foundation of contemporary art in jerusalem uh invited me for an exhibition called the jerusalem show which was uh basing itself on the theme of uh exhaustion and jerusalem syndrome which comes from the experience of fanaticism of people going to Jerusalem and suddenly believing that they've become Samson 
and having these kinds of lapses of understanding what's uh, what's reality and and what's delusion. And so, of course, I started to think about ways in which to do a project about Jerusalem without having it just be about Jerusalem. So there were four quarters of the city and there were four Beatles and I had access to the 150 hours of the Beatles last recordings. And so I wanted to narrate the breakup of the Beatles as a way of talking about how that city becomes divided uh, into these four sections separated by fear, not by walls and to see it as something that is an allegory for the collapse of the dream of Pan-Arabism and the deferral of justice for the Palestinian people. And, uh, and it was a really, it was an interesting um, project to do because I, I, I believe my friend Francois Boucher, who used to say this beautiful line that his father told him that in the poem about love, you don't use the word love. And so if I could do a project about Jerusalem without necessarily saying Jerusalem, or I could do a project about Palestine, but do something other than just sloganeering and making it clear that I stand in solidarity, um, then I wanted to do something that could be in fact poetic. And, uh, and it's an interesting project to talk about that we probably don't have time to do here, but we find out that the timeline of Pan-Arabism shares the exact same timeline with the coming together of the Beatles and the breakup. And uh, there were even plans that the band was um, engaged in to come and tour the Middle East, uh, but they ended up not doing it because George and Ringo voted against it. So we're going to move on to your second uh, essential selection, Michael. It also has two dates, 1975 and 1983. Uh, the person in question is Andy Kaufman. So please tell us a little bit about this choice. When I was growing up in Great Neck, Long Island, um, I remember actually watching from time to time Saturday Night Live with my parents in, in the 70s. And the nights that I got lucky enough to stay up that late, I would oftentimes see this crazy guy doing things like lip syncing uh, Mighty Mouse. And, and it was just the most absurd performance where this guy would come out in a suit or a sports jacket and looking very awkward and would set up a turntable and would play the Mighty Mouse theme song. And, um, and he wouldn't sing the words except um, lip sync. The, the only part he lip synced was the part, the chorus of here I come to save the day. And I thought it was the funniest thing. It was so absurd and I adored it. And then years later in 1983, I remember sitting with my parents in synagogue during Rosh Hashanah services and, and those services could be so boring. And I would sit there and I would be fidgety and, and uh, distracting. And my parents would point to the front row. They would say, you see who's up there? That's Andy Kaufman. He's the guy who makes you laugh on Saturday Night Live when he sings Mighty Mouse. And if he can sit through synagogue, you can too. And so I was amazed. I didn't know that Andy Kaufman was a fellow Great Neck resident. And it just made me think, well, I'm, I'm drinking the same water as he does. And, and, and I hope that I can be as weird as he is. And, and I think for me, Andy Kaufman has been spoken about a lot as, uh, as, as a kind of uh, a real trailblazer when it comes to uh, performance art and the way in which um, happenings can really, uh, you know, take up a space of risk in the way that we, that, that we really, when we really sort of see art being able to expose discomforts um, instead of it just being 
always about beauty. And, um, and so he's, he's somebody that I think really uh, brought me to the place where I started to understand people like Alan Caprow and, um, and the artists that really kind of pushed this, this imperative of art and life being indistinguishable. And so, um, so this was a very formative moment for me. And it, it was also very tragic because, you know, it wasn't long after that um, Andy Kaufman was not attending those services at our synagogue because he had, he had tragically passed away. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it for me is uh, a, a pivotal scene in my, 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 my story that I wasn't so clear on until until recently and um and i'm just very grateful for the for the work he left behind i um there's something that he, he so apparently uh was quite allergic to the uh, description comedian and uh he said at one point my only promise is that i will try to entertain you as best i can and um I mean, I've been watching clips, uh, re-watching clips, uh, and it's uh, another term for him as an anti-comedian. And there's something, like one can only imagine how bewildering it would have been for a, a, a national television audience uh, to watch someone get up and tell very bad jokes intentionally, do very bad impressions intentionally, um, there was something, as you say, uh, there was something very Dada about it, right? Like it could have been the Cabaret Voltaire. Um, and, but at the same time, it was deeply, deeply moving. And it wasn't just arch for the sake of archness. There was something extremely human, I think, about Andy Kaufman. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about his uh, passing later on because it also ties into, I think, some other themes. So onto, our, onto your next uh, essential, um, Michael. It's the Lion Hunt of Ashi Bernal at the British Museum. And I believe the date here is 1984. So uh, please tell us, what is this and why is it in your list, please? In February of 1984, my grandmother, Renee Shamoun, uh, passed away and we grew up in her house, uh, the house that she and my grandfather Nisim uh, bin Ishaq Da'ud Betaziz had, um, had purchased when they came over from Iraq in 1947. And she died in our home. And again, I was uh, party to uh, a grieving process that that really cut through me and, um, and, and made me realize, you know, just how much we lost in that moment. My grandfather died in 1975. And when my grandmother died in 84, that was the last connection to Iraq, you know, in the house. My mother left uh, when she was very, very young and came to the U S actually via India where my grandparents had, um, had migrated to, in the aftermath of the Farhud uh, or the violent dispossession of, um, of Baghdad's Jew, Jews in, uh, in June of 41. And um, realizing that this disconnection uh, had happened, uh, my mother was adamant about, um, about us going to London on this trip that had been planned before my grandmother died. Um, that it was even more meaningful now because we were going to London to visit her, her brother Niazi and his wife Tifa. And uh, so that part of the family had migrated to London in the 1940s. And it was, it was an amazing trip. I mean, you know, it was the first time I'd been outside the country and um, you finally feel like you're living on a planet. You know, the people are driving on the other side of the road. The buses look weird their double decker it was it was amazing and uh, we got to hear these stories from my uncle Niazi about my grandmother and he and Iraq and um, and on one of the days that we were that we were visiting uh, my mother 
and my father took me and my two brothers to the British Museum. And as soon as we got through uh, the entrance, my mother just kind of, it was almost like she had radar. We went across the Great Hall and right into the Assyrian section of the museum. And there off on the side of the corridor that displays the panels that were taken from places like the Northwest Palace of Nimrod uh, was, um, was the lion hunt of Ashurbanipal. And she sat me and my brothers down on a bench in front of these wall reliefs. And um, she said to me and my brothers, this is the first comic book in human history. And she explained that each panel was sequential, showing a different scene in these lion hunts that the king had participated in. Mm -hmm. And she said, and it, and, and it comes from the place that I'm from and that your grandmother was from. And this sense of pride welling up inside of me, like, oh my God, you know, there's nothing cooler than hearing about the first comic book in human history when you're 10 and then to hear that your people did it, it was amazing. And then my mother turned to us and said, and what is it doing here? And, and that cut right through us, the tore right through us. And so suddenly, you know, I didn't feel like I was necessarily in a museum. I felt like I was in a crime palace. And so ever since then, whenever I visited encyclopedic museums, um, I've always referred to them as imperial museums because the, the legacy of empire is there. And in a lot of ways, I'm here because they were there. Um, and so, you know, it's a sweet and sour experience of being able to have that proximity to a place that I've not been to. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, I look at these as being held hostage um, by these institutions. And I think it really kind of framed for me very early on in my life um, a certain kind of anger that I feel towards these institutions. Um, and I didn't know about decoloniality, you know, when I was 10, but um, my mother was once again this incredible guide at showing me the way in which art can tell you so much more than what you're just hearing or what you're seeing, that there's more to it. And am I right in thinking, therefore, Michael, that you would dream of uh, repatriating everything in every encyclopedic museum uh, that had been pillaged and displaced from where it originally was? I absolutely believe that. Um, one of the things that uh, drives a lot of the work that I'm doing now is, you know, to realize that so much of what I'm reappearing, that whether it's the artifacts that were looted from the National Museum of Iraq or the panels that you see behind me here um, that were destroyed in the, uh, the site, the archaeological site of Nimrud, uh, not far from from Mosul um, by Daesh in 2015, that these things disappear not because of the way in which the narrative gets flattened by the West, that it's just about uh, a kind of, um, a, 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 about a, a kind of aesthetics that's meant to, to follow uh, the teachings of Islam and being pure in that sense, I think they're disappearing because we value them so much. And that value that we've had for these objects in the West, um, and I say this as a kind of schizophrenic we, you know, because I find myself disconnected as well, you know, and, and feeling the anger um, as somebody that grew up in an Iraqi household, um, that... Uh, that the, the care for these objects never extends to the care for the people. And so if we think about what Daesh might have said, you know, hypothetically, before the destruction of the Northwest Palace of Nimrud, and they said, we have 200 panels that are inside this site, and the West took 
the 400 panels out of there from because there were 600 originally. Um, we're going to destroy them unless you open up your borders and allow for them to go to your museums. Every country in the West would have opened up their borders. But if they said we're going to kill 200 people that live uh, alongside the, the Northwest Palace of Nimrud, uh, whether they're Assyrians or Yazidis, I can guarantee you that every country would have kept their borders closed. So for me, this is, this is very clear. And I've run up against a lot of um, museum directors that when I, when I tried to pressure them, you know, to repatriate, um, they have answered that they're very proud of the fact that, um, that they've been able to help, uh, you know, Facta Marte or other organizations that 3D print um, these artifacts to allow for their Lamasu, for instance, to, um, to be 3D printed uh, and then they get sent to a place like the University of Mosul and they see that as a replacement for what Daesh mm -hmm. destroyed. And if the 3D replacement is so satisfactory, then why mm -hmm. the f aren't these museums in the West accepting the 3D replica of what's in their collection and sending the originals back? And I think that tells you everything you need to know. You know, these are very much racist endeavors. And, um, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more clear on that. And, um, and it is sh shaping the way that I move forward um, with, with this particular kind of work. Um, moving forward, uh, Michael, it sounds like your mother was one of your great educators. Um, this gentleman was uh, another one of your great educators. And I believe we're up to 1992 at this point. So could you tell us who Alan Wexler was and what he meant to you? Well, Alan Wexler is one of my favorite artists and humans in the world. And um, he was a teacher of mine and was the best teacher that I ever had. Uh, I was studying at Purchase College, SUNY, um, State University of New York system. And Alan came as a visiting artist in the spring semester of 1992 to teach a class and it was a special topics class in sculpture. And I didn't know much about Alan, Alan's work at that time, but he was so transformative as a teacher, um, got us to really look at the mundane as a possibility for the sacred or the profane and had us doing incredible, incredible exercises like sweeping the floor every day. Um, and, and so these sweeping sessions would become very performative. And uh, there was all of a sudden this kind of bridge even to the absurdity of, of a person like uh, Andy Kaufman. And Alan's own work, which he shared with us very generously, was, was steeped in a kind of brilliance and also humor. Um, one of my favorite pieces of his was uh, a, a work where he had taken apart a brawn coffee maker and he removed all of the plastic encasements and uh, put it back together and it exposed the process and the system through which the coffee gets made. These very simple things. And then another piece that he had done was a set of coffee cups. He did a whole series of projects that were ruminations on coffee, but one of them that was so simple and so um, profound that I loved was, uh, was these coffee cups that were all colored a different brown. They were all tinted a different brown. And what he found was that these were uh, coffee cups that he had glazed um, to the precise color of people in his family and how much cream they liked in their coffee. So you put in enough cream to the point where you would then just match what the color and glaze was on, on the cups themselves. And these moments of lightness um, that also engaged with, with, with a, a very rigorous conceptual practice um, just opened up a world for me on, on who I could be. And I had the great fortune of being his, his uh, studio assistant in the summer of 1992. And, um, and I got to see what kind of person he was and, and, 
and the family that he uh, he and his wife Ellen had built, and and it just made me realize that there could also be uh, an artistic life without without having to sacrifice those other things that I held so dear. Uh, coming from a family that I love very much, and um, and he just became uh, this incredible incredible role model, you know, without, without saying it, I can't say it in any other way. And he was also and remains one of my favorite artists in the world. And he was an architect also. So he, he, he was an architect slash artist. And so it made me realize that I didn't have to be any one thing in my life, you know, that, uh, that, that there was something about occupying two different professions uh, that, that echoed with the identity also of being an Arab Jew, you know, and all these different possibilities where people kind of like, you know, they, they can't understand the hyphen, you know, uh, Toni Morrison said in America, uh, American means white, everybody else has to hyphenate. So Arab Jew, Iraqi American, you know, arch uh, architect slash artist, you know, like those were all things that were exciting me at that point that I didn't, have to be any one thing. And, um, and so he taught me uh, also like that, that Passover, for instance, he'd done some work with the, the Passover Seder and he made me believe, um, and I can't kind of came to this conclusion after speaking with him so much that Passover was maybe the first happening as an artwork, you know, and, uh, and they decided it was so good that, they decided to do it every year and the magical meaning that gets projected onto the different things that are on the Seder plate, you know, of um, the, the Haroset, you know, which is meant to kind of be a stand in for the mortar uh, that was used by the enslaved Hebrews in Egypt. Um, that these, that, that this was that the Haroset that, that's made from grinding up, you know, in Iraqi traditions, Iraqi Jewish traditions, it's date syrup and crushed walnuts. And to realize that like, oh my God, I'm eating architecture um, was just this, this amazing realization and, and an epiphany to have uh, when studying with Alan. He, he just changed my life, brought so much of conceptual art into my understanding. And I think that that's a very radical and kind thing it's like radical hospitality because if I think about my life uh, going to art school in 1991 before the internet and um, without really truly understanding what modern art was, to have guides in your teachers that could bridge you know, the awesomeness that somebody feels that looking at the Renaissance to understanding you know, John Cage and Gordon Mata Clark and Yoko Ono, I mean, I'll never forget it. And, um, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to call him a friend. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, I believe also we have two dates here, 1996 and uh, the year 2000. It's uh, the first film by uh, Ilya Suleiman, Chronicle of a Disappearance. Um, and perhaps we'll watch a couple of short clips to give people an idea of... Shalom. 
So, Michael, uh, this film by uh, Elias Suleiman came out in 1996, but I believe that you saw it first uh, in the year 2000. So could you tell us a little bit about why this has made it onto your list, please? Well, in the year 2000, uh, in the aftermath of the second Intifada, um, I found myself going every Monday night to 16 Beaver Street, which uh, was an organization, a really kind of loose collective of, of artists and thinkers that, that were very generously holding space weekly. And uh, two of the primary people who had put it together, Rene Gabri and Irene Anastas, were, um, were just phenomenal in their generosity and also the kind of um, the kind of time that they created for all of us to look at things together and it's um, I owe a lot to that space for furthering my own ideas about uh, what it means to engage with your work uh, politically um, but also w ways in which there's all these other abstract languages that have been developed in, in different um, artist practices that that interrogate all of this in a direct manner, but do so uh, in in a way that really uh, involves creating a new form. And on one of those nights, um, on one of those Monday nights, there was the screening of Chronicle of a Disappearance and and I was completely floored. Um, Ilya Suleiman is one of my favorite directors and um, his experience as a Palestinian uh, that, that lives in Palestine and also in the diaspora, I think has, has created a kind of cadence in his work that's very slow. Um, uh, it's very austere in certain moments, and it also is is incredibly funny. Um, he makes such a great use of humor as a vehicle, but there's always a moment of rupture in his work and these kinds of interventionist um, strategies that I became so familiar with in the kind of public art that I became interested in, whether it was the projections of Krzysztof Wodichko or uh, the bus shelters of Dennis Adams, both of whom were teachers of mine in graduate school. Um, these moments of rupture were activated in his films in a way where I could see something of that kind of work that I was invested in, uh, in public space, um, creating those moments of, of, of confusion and uh, suggesting a moment of radical transformation. And so the clip that we just watched where you have these Israeli police that um, drive up on a section of Jerusalem uh, in an urgent way, and it's, it's because they all need to urinate. This scene is, uh, is, is an important setup because when Suleiman's character comes and finds that uh, one of those policemen in the rush to get back onto the truck has dropped their communicator, that communicator then becomes the uh, the weapon through which there's a kind of redirection of the police from a Palestinian activist uh, giving false directions to to the police and and it, it it serves as the crescendo of the film. But I think more importantly, uh, Suleiman's work also introduced me to a kind of deep thinking about what winning looks like and doesn't look like. And, and so in, in one of his DVD commentaries, he talks about how he will be the first to put up the Palestinian flag when the time comes and he'll be the first one to also take it down. And you recognize in that statement that he's paraphrasing Mahmoud Darwish a little bit, but he's pointing more directly to the fact that if the only goal of justice is 
is the establishment of, of the nation state, which he acknowledges as, as an important moment of accountability, um, then, then it, it's, then our, our goals are, 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 are too low, you know, that it's all low hanging fruit, that there's more uh, to be done, you know, to, than to simply become a nation state. And I've always appreciated about that, that about the artists that I'm attracted to, like the deeper thinking that comes out in intangible mm -hmm. moments where there's the artist talk or the interview. And, um, you know, but he, he, he makes films that for me are reminiscent of, of the work of Jacques Tati. And, mm -hmm. uh, and again, I think humor as a vehicle is something that's very important to me. And, and I've learned a lot watching his films. So Michael, this experience that you had at 16 Beaver Street, um, seeing Elia Suleiman's film for the first time also introduced you to someone else that became very important to your life. Could you tell us about um, Emily Jassia and uh, how she also fits into this timeline of yours? Yeah, um, Emily is one of the most, um, one of the most incredible artists working today and um, and is one of my favorite artists, but also one of my best friends. And this all started for me at 16 Beaver. So at the same time that we were all watching uh, Chronicle of a Disappearance and discussing, you know, what has been called the second intifada, um, I became very close with Emily through through 16 Beaver and everything that it, it brought. And I found myself working on this piece of Emily's that's kind of a, a, a pinnacle work of hers. It's called Monument to 418 Palestinian Villages, which were destroyed, depopulated, and occupied by Israel in 1948. And what was incredible about this work was the simultaneity of just realizing what you were reckoning with. Um, that this was, uh, for me, in a lot of ways, um, a kind of participation in, in, in a, a kind of social, socially engaged art project. It basically involved this UN issued tent, refugee tent, uh, and then um, a, a community basically that formed to help embroider the names of those 418 disappeared villages. And every night that we gathered, there would be, there would be music, somebody would be playing oud. Um, there would be uh, conversations that were happening that uh, would directly reference exactly what it was we were doing. And so when your hands are doing something, it frees up your mind to do something else. And this was a pivotal moment for me. I don't think I'd had that kind of intimacy and proximity um, to, to people who were directly affected by the criminal, criminal occupation of Palestine. And Emily brought all of that forth through her talent and her willingness to slow things down through her processes and to, to, to realize that it wasn't just necessary to enlist all these different pairs of hands to make this work, but it also made it so much more powerful to realize that there was a kind of town <laughs> that had formed um, in grieving the, 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 the disappearance and the depopulation of these these 418 villages, and so I I found myself part of that. But then I found myself part of Emily's life, and uh, she's become a big part of mine. And um, I'm very proud of the work that she's doing right now in in Bethlehem with Dar Jasser, where she and her family. Uh, including her sister Anne-Marie Jasser, 
have um, used the family house that's that's in Bethlehem uh, to create a kind of critical residency uh, right there um, and, and in the shadow of the apartheid wall. And um, and it, it shows that there's a lot that Emily's work has done uh, to illustrate what it means to be making art uh, as a person who's under siege. And when you go to Darjasser, it raises the question of what it does it mean to make work in a town that's under siege, in a in a uh, for people that are constantly under siege. And so um, I don't think that I would be doing the work that I'm doing with without my friendship with Emily, and um, and she's been somebody who's helped me to kind of understand myself and my work uh, as somebody who is an Arab Jew um, through her own experience as somebody who is from, from Palestine and the way in which we can work with the material of distance and diaspora uh, as, as something that, that eliminates, you know, the, the possibility of the simple answer of, of return, you know, of, of talking about why return continues to be an, an impossibility, but also if we're going to talk about justice, a necessity. And, um, and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for our friendship. Thank you, Michael. So onto your uh, uh, penultimate uh, choice. Um, uh, a novelist who uh, was inspired to write fiction because of his love of cinema uh, in the in the 1960s, uh, Don DeLillo, and uh, his great magnum opus, um, Underworld, which came out in 1997. But in particular, um, a, uh, a a unit of that book, uh, Pathgo at the Wall that precedes uh, Underworld, but uh, was released as a novella afterwards. So um, Michael um, DeLillo, tell us about your relationship with, with him and with this book, please. Um, well, I was given this book by uh, an artist who I commuted to, uh, with to uh, one of our adjunct teaching positions in New York and, um, and you can see the cover right there. It was like a, a real tome. Um, and I never read anything like that before. I read it, I think, in, in 2000. And, of course, you know, as a, a book that I was always lugging around with me post-2001, it meant something else to people who looked at the cover. Um, but for me, the setup of the, of the novel was just amazing i'm a huge baseball fan and um and also uh, i i read a lot about historical moments in games and uh the scene that's being set up in uh the playoffs between um the brooklyn dodgers and the new york giants back in the 1950s is um is a very well-known game uh, becomes one of the most important play-by-play um, -play calls that happens on the radio. It, it's a transformative moment because the person who's, uh, who's actually at the mic, Gil Hodges, can't contain his excitement and just keeps yelling, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. And, and before that, you have to stay very contained and he breaks from it, you know? So again, this moment of a rupture, um, and I felt like the novel did that as well. Um, the, the novel really breaks from the constraints of so much uh, narrative work that I read before. And so, you know, you, you have the postmodern novel, um, you know, the recipe of it in the book and you have moments where there's the unreliable narrator. Um, but for me, the very beginning of having all these vectors of history descend on on this one game uh where you have jackie gleason in the crowd and and uh j edgar hoover and 
and all of these unlikely figures, you know, to be watching the same thing at the same time, you realize that we are, in fact, watching the same thing at the same time, you know, and he just brings all the bodies into the same building. And um, the thing about this baseball game that I love so much is uh, I grew up as a collector of baseball memorabilia with my brothers and my father. And it's a true story that the ball um, that was hit for the shot heard around the world when, um, when Bobby Thompson hits the home run that brings the Giants into the World Series, which is the championship game. Um, that, that was just um, a kind of an incredible moment you know, to be thinking about as a collector because the ball does in fact go missing. And it becomes a setup for this story where the ball goes through all these different points of ownership and the pursuit of it is a big part of it. And so it is like this Holy grail. Um, but it's of course the MacGuffin as well, you know, that it's uh, the, the, the object itself is more like what Winnicott calls the, the transitional object that it's uh, it's it's not really about that. It's about all of these social um, uh, engagements and encounters that happen around it, and so that becomes mm -hmm. the material. It's not the actual thing, uh, which is something that happens a lot in my work. You know that that it's about the relationships that get formed with the different communities of people that I engage with in terms of the craft, and what we're left with is a kind of residual. Um, but in fact those relationships that go into that object, you know, while I don't think they're always absent, um, it's also something that, um, that one needs to look more closely at the object in order to see. And so that, that's, that's one of the reasons this book resonated with me. And, and I've, I've always admired uh, DeLillo's writing, but it, it changed my life. And it also, I think, changed the way that um, I thought about installation art. You know, because if I think about the way in which I work and the way that I set up my projects, I'm, I'm a lot more interested in doing what Delilo does, which is to disobey convention. Uh, and you can say this about a lot of artists, including David Foster, uh, a lot of authors, including David Foster Wallace, you know, um, but this was the first postmodern novel <clears throat> that I read. And I think for me, it just, uh, it opened up uh, the way that I think about narrative, but also the way that I think about how to spatially present narrative. It's also, I think, I mean, it's, it's nice where it is on your timeline, because for me, uh, DeLillo uh, is, uh, you know, one of the great authors of, you know, Ameri the century of paranoia, uh, of the um, the, the pivot towards uh, the conspiracy theory as uh, a kind of alternate parallel reality. And so, you know, your mention of uh, the, the assassination of JFK right at the beginning, uh, many would argue this is the beginning of uh, conspiracy theories in, in, in America. Uh, there's also a conspiracy theory apparently about Andy Kaufman's death. Uh, some pe many people believe that he, it was a hoax, that he faked it because he was such a prankster. And um, so there are still people that believe he's alive somewhere. And, you know, and obviously right now we are living through, I think, one of, I mean, it's interesting, DeLillo has a new novel coming out just right now called The Silence. And, you know, again, he wrote it before uh, the pandemic, uh, before this new reality that we've entered into. But once again, it's as though he sensed it coming. He has this extraordinary power uh, of uh, near, almost prophecy. And um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's I, I'm very grateful that he's written another novel at age 83. Um, and I'm sure it's going to shed light on uh, the strange time that we find ourselves in. Michael, onto your very, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't um, get to talk about this. Um, but uh, it's a letter, maybe you want to quickly say something about it. Yeah, so, so when, I 
so when when Omar Khalif uh, was curating my first survey exhibition um, at the MCA Chicago, he asked me, who, who, who's the dream author for you to write for your catalog? And of course I said, Don DeLillo. And I didn't think anything of it. And Omar actually went and had <clears throat> this, um, had the museum write to Don DeLillo to ask him, this is the best rejection letter I've ever gotten um, because it, it looks like it's typed. Uh, and, um, and so he's, uh, he's declining the invitation, but, uh, but I'll always have this letter. It, this is my, this is my, my home run ball from, from the, <laughs> the world series. I'm, I'm, I, for one, I'm very jealous because he, he's been using the same typewriter since 1975 and no doubt this was wow. written on there. Yeah. Well, we can change the the name, you know, Photoshop to Shimon Bassar. <laughs> you know, and you could have one too. I'll, I'll get it framed. Cool. Okay, and on to your very last uh, uh, essential choice. Another, uh, and at this point we're at 2009. So, Michael, wh where are we and why are we with Mr. Leonard Cohen? So... I married a girl from Montreal, and um, when you marry someone from Montreal, there are two things that you have to learn to do, and one is skiing, and the second one is accepting Leonard Cohen as your chief rabbi, and um, and I'd never grown up, you know, being a particularly uh, keen Leonard Cohen fan. In fact, I think I, I ran from it a little bit because everybody in art school loved Leonard Cohen, and 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 I just you know um, didn't didn't want to necessarily go where everybody else was going. And um, and in two thousand nine, um, my. My wife, Lori Waxman, received from her parents as a birthday gift two tickets to go see Leonard Cohen live at the Chicago Theater, uh, theater on Wednesday, May 6, 2009. And, um, and so I went not knowing what to expect. I knew that this was a very rare opportunity that Cohen had not toured um, since the 90s. And that this was a tour that was necessitated because his former manager had cheated him to the point where um, he was broke. Um, I went and it was quite possibly the best live music experience that I've ever witnessed. It, I always describe it as being something where there's an intersection of Elvis Presley on one side and Yom Kippur services on another. And it was just so profound. Um, I absolutely loved his presence. I loved the fact that, that I was seeing an example of the way in, in, in which the, the voice, the elderly voice um, was actually offering for me a kind of utterance that, that brought forth a kind of world from the lungs and, and, and the vocal cords of, of this person in front of me. And, um, and so from there on, I, I became a fanatic once again. I, I never thought I'd have that moment in my life again where um, it was akin to my mother introducing me to the Beatles and um, and so when I got home that night from the concert, I was wired and I went online and I started to search uh, Leonard Cohen websites. And one of the chat boards actually had the subject heading October 22nd, 1973. And that was the day I was born. And when I clicked on, on the link, a photograph came up of Cohen surrounded by the Israeli army in the deserts of the Sinai and next to him 
was Ariel Sharon. And I thought to myself, what the hell is my new hero, you know, doing with this mm -hmm. war criminal? And it mm -hmm. turns out that Cohen had uh, tried to enlist in the Israeli army during the 1973 uh, Ramadan war, or the October war, or the Yom Kippur war, whatever you want to call it. And um, instead they said, no, you're Leonard Cohen. Um, you know, here's a guitar, uh, go entertain the troops. And it was the weirdest thing, right? Because Leonard Cohen is called the Prince of Bummers. You know, some, somebody said that it's a uh, music to slit your wrist to in one of the reviews for his music. And he actually turns to them and says, you know, my songs are sad, you'll, lo you, you'll lose the war. And, uh, and they said, no, 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 it'll be okay. And, um, and I was fascinated because for me, as somebody who has signed on to the, um, the Palestinian academic and cultural boycott of Israel, I became very interested in, in, in the way in which, you know, the decisions that artists make and the things we say yes to and the things we say no to are equally important. And so Cohen for me became this illustration of the ethical crisis of the post-Holocaust Jew. And um, I've investigated it in a project um, that has since been censored by the Cohen estate. Um, but long story short, I think for me, Cohen has actually um, introduced me to like another form through which um, the, the music can engage with, um, with ritual, you know, can engage with the profundity of scripture, you know, Jewish, Jewish um, scripture, which is a lot more like philosophy. And, um, you know, somebody from the New Yorker once wrote that Cohen was like in front of our eyes during this tour, uh, slowly um, disintegrating into this mist of Buddhist eroticism and being able to watch somebody at the end of their life, you know, performing for you and being very aware of their impending mortality was something that I think I'll, I'll never forget, but, um, but it, it's a kind of multivalent um, presence for me in this short timeline that we're investigating together um, because he does all of that for me. And there, there's also a kind of probing for me into the work and the decisions that he's made that, um, that talk about, you know, for instance, what is the fate of an artwork uh, at a time of, of boycott? And, um, and so it's, it's, a, it's nice to have a moment like that this, this, at this point in life and in middle age, you know, to, to become a fanatic once again. Um, mm -hmm. and to feel like I'm, I'm new at learning about somebody. Thank you so much, Michael. We've come to the end of your uh, essential list. Uh, those of you watching uh, at this point, we will uh, be switching from this recorded version to uh, our live selves. Um, just about right now. So are there models of institutions where you think they're doing the right thing? Re -re Repatriation and engaging with artifacts and communities ethically, or are they too big and unmovable? It's a good question. Um, and I have to admit that I probably don't know what everyone is doing. Yeah. Um, and I've not actually seen it in a lot of the places that I've been involved in with conversations. Um, and I'd be open to hearing about any of those places that any of the attendees feel as though um, is, is operating in that manner. Um, but for instance, I mean, um, at the Oriental Institute, it's a real name at the University of Chicago, um, you know, there's, there's a history there of works that, that do need to go back. Um, but there's also a history of a kind of um, 
reciprocal relationship that the Institute had with Iraqi archaeologists um, from the middle of the 20th century onward, you know, where there really was a kind of um, a mutuality, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so some of those things you look at in the collection, you realize that that's the result of a relationship that's based on equity, you know, but you can't erase the fact that a lot of that stuff that comes before it um, is not. And so I think that those, those kinds of things really do need to be investigated. But to the point that I said during the talk with you, you know, with the mania surrounded things like 3D printing and everyone thinking this is a, a, a fine way to proceed and that you can achieve the, the patina of history, you know, by painting these things and aging them, then, then for me, this opens up another fury, which is why those things are not then being held in the, the collections of the British Museum and the originals being returned. Yeah. And, and, you know, the other question that was asking me about, you know, being co-opted, that is a danger. Yeah. That is a really big danger of, of working in this field. And in recent years, I've really tried to recalibrate my relationship to those things of what I will not allow to continue any longer. And without saying too much about you know, some things that I've actually put forward as a procedural and as an agreement. Um, I'll say that, you know, the, the recent mania of encyclopedic museums deciding that they want to work with artists from these regions that they've looted from as a way of intervening in their collections, you know, is, um, is something that I can see becoming that form of co-option you know, that it becomes the magnanimity of a museum being able to kind of accommodate institutional critique as a way of letting things just continue. So mm -hmm. now, as a matter of process, if these museums do contact me going forward, there will not be a participation. There will not be an intervention unless something is returned, you know? So that, yeah. you know, that there's, there's so, something about everything that is given for me as an artist can also be taken away. Um, and, and that's something that I do think is about uh, a realization of what your role can become in this ecosystem that we're in. Um, some people call it leverage, uh, but at the same time, you know, the work that I was doing five years ago is not necessarily as informed as it is now you know, by everything else that continues to sculpt the work. All this work is ongoing because I um, retain the right to change my mind and to change the way that I'm going to proceed with institutions going forward. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, just to continue, there, a couple of questions came in, and I think because obviously the question about monuments is so... Um, you know, vivid and, and alive at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to distill uh, this, but uh, somebody said your presentation today and your exhibition at Art Jamil offer a complex rumination around monuments, where in some cases the everyday is made into a monument, and in some cases the monument is desecrated into the everyday. Uh, and here's the question. Can you share your thoughts on, on monuments generally especially in light of decolonization and, be, and Black Lives Matter, where all monuments must fall? And there was a second question that echoes this as well. Well, I, I, I think that the monument to the everyday is something that was very much alive in those conversations with Alan Wexler and, you know, having a relationship to conceptual art where the everyday or the mundane, mundane can be raised to the level of the sacred or the profane, you know, and that has a lot to do with the everyday object suddenly, you know, having a provenance that's more than just what it is. That's the ready-made and it's involved in so much of what I've done with the reappearances of the, um, of the artifacts and uh, the monuments from Iraq, um, you know, but in a way that is not just about referencing, you know, something like Warhol, um, but it's rather a compost of these different communities that have been displaced, 
you know, and now have their, the packaging of their food in both English and Arabic um, because mm-hmm. they're living elsewhere. Um, so there's those moments of survival in there as well. As it pertains to, you know, what we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter and, and the, the reconsideration of monuments, these are conversations that I'm having constantly, and I feel like I've been having them constantly since studying with people like Christoph Wodichko at, um, at MIT, you know, whose own kind of feeling about monuments is that they, um, they are essentially forgetting machines. But a really mm-hmm. good way of forgetting somebody is to, you know, name a building after them or create a monument because they no longer speak. But all of a sudden we're seeing that these monuments do speak, you know, that the appearance of the Confederate monuments throughout the United States, which is something that happens many decades after the end of the Civil War, you know, in the 1920s and 1930s as a way for groups like the Daughters of the Confederacy to more or less insist that the South wins the war. One second. Yeah. Um, is something that's about a, a kind of violent revisionist history. And so these are things that absolutely, you know, I, again, I want to be led by the communities who are directly affected by these monuments to figure out, um, you know, how they should be disappeared. The way in which the Robert E. Lee statue in, in uh, Charleston um, actually was, uh, was, was addressed in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder um, is remarkable because it became also a palimpsest of fury and anger with the words that started to accumulate onto the base of the sculpture. Um, and so I see that as, as, as some, something that I don't want to trivialize simply as a work of art. Um, it's a work of, of life and it's a work of, um, of anger and it's a work you know, that suddenly becomes uh, an admonishment, not just a monument. And so that, that for me are the open spaces of, of how these disappearances can also hold the space of why they've disappeared. Um, one of the things that I'm wrestling with here in Chicago is we have quite a lot of, of, of monuments that uh, celebrate the exclusion and the eradication of indigenous Americans. And one of the plaques that one finds downtown is celebrating the birth of the city's first white child. And that's a monument that I want p- more people to see, you know, mm. because uh, especially around the time of election years, people start to talk about how, oh, this is not who we are. I think this mm. is exactly who we are, you mm. know? And I think that getting to the root of that and being able to actually see that is the work that, that people, that, that, that white America has to do. Um, in understanding, you know, just um, how absurd, you know, the social experiment or the failed social experiment of America is and how violent it is and how it's built upon all of these foundations, not only of indigenous exclusion and, and, and genocide, um, but also um, that, that chattel slavery is what builds the, builds the, the country that's sitting on top of it. Um, and and that, that's a reckoning that has to happen through monuments, but it also has to happen at every level of institutionality in this mm-hmm. country as well. Thank you. Um, uh, a slight pivot, but, but still related, I think a question that, that um, asked, when creating work, Michael, how do you navigate the intersection between personal childhood memories and the memories held by the collective Arab community is one more powerful influencing the other? Um, That's a great question. I think that, you know, one of the things that I've really, that I've really kind of felt um, emerged in, you know, not just my work, 
but as a fact of life, as I started to do my work, was being able to engage with people, you know, and, and to travel, you know, to, to places that, um, that are close to my, my family's ancestral home. Um, and also participate in the same culture has, you know, enabled me, you know, to feel like those personal memories are not just so personal, you know, that those are actually more collective um, than one might think, you know, that even though there is the idiosyncrasy of, you know, growing up in the home of exiles, um, you know, my grandparents, I've said this before, were like the first installation artists that I ever met. You know, they created a home where everything that was on the floor was from Iraq. Everything that was on the walls was from Iraq. What was coming out of the stereo during family celebrations was from Iraq. And, um, and what was coming out of the kitchen was definitely from Iraq. You know, my grandparent, my grandmother like succeeded, I guess, in casting a a house and the smell of cumin every night. And, um, and so that, that to me is, you know, like I used to, when I would go and I would visit, visit my friends, uh, you know, during play dates growing up and their parents, you know, had just arrived from Iran, you know, in the late seventies, early eighties, you get that familiar smell, you know, and you realize, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, that, yeah, I get that. I don't know what it is at age 11 or whatever, but, you know, I guess it's turmeric or the, it's this, or it's that. And as I've, you know, started to engage um, with the way in which the, the story of the Arab Jew is, is intricately and intimately intertwined, you know, uh, through disappearance narrative with, you know, Palestine, um, you know, just being able to kind of understand that a lot of those, um, those feelings of fikra, you know, of memory. Um, but it's more than memory. It's more Proustian, you know, than, than just memory. It can't really be translated. Uh, or that, or the experience of samud, you know, of steadfastness, that the insistence to remember these things, um, you know, is something that I've come across as a real common thread in these narratives. And... Um, and uh, my, my scope of understanding what I'm doing has been broadened, uh, you know, by, by actually, you know, traveling um, and spending time in places like Ramallah, where the artist Shuru Karb, um, during one of my conversations about the artifacts that I'm, that I'm reappearing, you know, said that it was a shame that there were no Syrian English newspapers in Chicago, you know, because in some ways that, that language um, appearing as part of that compost uh, that makes these reappearances would, would speak about yet another minority, you know, that, that, was, that was, you know, displaced uh, in the construction of something that's considered monolithically Arab. And, you know, so getting at some of those stories about, you know, who, who is allowed to be Arab, you know, who belongs in a moment of hyper-nationalism. You know, those are things that I hope to make surface in the work even more as I go forward. But I wouldn't have known that unless I was engaging more intimately with what the attendee has asked, you know, what about those stories, you know, from, from the collective. And I think the important thing is that the collectives should never be seen as monolithic. It's just a series of tributaries you know, that, that all kind of like, you know, feed into a narrative stream. But I think it's important to also, you know, be willing to hear how everything can still be heard on a, on a different register. Yeah. Okay, penultimate question. And then uh, I reserve my executive right to ask you the, the last question. Um, hold on, where is this? Uh, let me just pull this up. And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna, pass this on and you will know exactly why, Michael. Um, the question is, are you interested in exploring gender in your future works? Exploring gender, that's an interesting idea. Um, well, you know what? It's, it's an interesting idea. I, I have to say that 
that when gender has come up in my work, it's usually come up as um, as something that, you know, for instance, when I was in London and doing one of the culinary projects that I do called Dar al Sal, um, my aunt, my auntie Tifa um, was in her mid 90s at the time. And I saved some tibit, which is an Iraqi Jewish dish that's made during the Sabbath. And it's a, you know, a very tedious dish to make. And, um, and I brought it to her and she was horrified um, that I as a man was cooking, you know. And so this, this was a very, you know, sad last meeting that I had with my aunt before she passed away. And, you know, there's, there's all the things that happen, you know, in, in old age, um, you know, where, where you start to, you know, the, like the, the conversations just aren't as agile as they were. And, um, you know, but it started to make me understand a little bit, you know, that there was, um, there was something about this, this craft of cooking, craft traditions in general. You know, if I look at it in the art world, um, you know, that it's often been relegated to almost like a, a gendered practice. Um, and, uh, and storytelling also, you know, would not be part of my practice unless it was for Joan Jonas, you know, who was listening to me, you know, present um, the work that I was doing about uh, the homeless shelters and suddenly recognized the fact that, that these couldn't just be these minimalist, aloof artworks, you know, that didn't include the personal. Um, you know, so I've wondered about where all of that falls, you know, um, and the way that art is taught in the way that art is spoken about as, as something that deals with gender, but explicitly, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can't say that I'm thinking about it, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we are running out of time. Um, so Michael, I, my, I'm gonna ask the last question. Um, yeah, so yeah. if, if we imagine that uh, your essential had come on a on a CD, um, and there were one or two extra bonus tracks at the end, secret bonus tracks, without delving into great detail, just curious, would you know what those bonus tracks would be? Like, what would number eight and nine or ten have have been that maybe just didn't quite creep in? Yeah, well, what I tried to do with this essential, you know, when you gave me the, um, the proposition um, of, of coming up with these, I think it's seven, mm. um, you know, I, I, I wanted to be really honest about it. Um, mm -hmm. And as somebody who went to art school, you know, before the internet um, and and when, you know, through their, their training, you know, one thing that I look back on now um, is just how absent, you know, um, black artists are in the examples that were given to me. Mm -hmm. And also that there's a, a real poverty of the, the, the artists that identify as, as female or non-binary. And those kinds of things I think are really important to recognize as being, you know, part of the urgency of this moment, which is that there's been, um, there's been a real exclusion. And in the years, you know, since I, I've, you know, become my first person, you know, the, um, the people that have been you know, really impactful on me, you know, in the last decade have included, you know, artists like uh, M. Carmen Lane, who is a, um, a black and indigenous artist from uh, Cle Cleveland. And their work has um, really kind of framed for me a lot of the possibilities of how um, the urgency and the anger, you know, in my work can, can be, um, you know, be made more 
uh, apparent. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell him. Tell him he's got to share. Otherwise, I'm coming. Up. Sorry, the kids are fighting over the iPad. Um, and then, um, you know, I would also include um, Natalia Dimitruk, who is the sign language interpreter of, um, or former sign language interpreter, interpreter of UT1, uh, which was Ukraine's television channel. And during the Orange Revolution, um, through sign language, she was able to kind of uh, uh, subvert the state authorities in in giving people the accurate election results, um, and that was a moment of circumvention um, that it was like an artwork uh, that wasn't an artwork. And then I would also include my engagement with uh, Miss Samaria Rice, um, the mother of Tamir Rice, um, with whom I collaborated on a project in 2018. And um, her steadfastness, you know, in being able to kind of insist on reminding um, is, is something that is, that is also just uh, completely reframed and redirected my own practice. So I don't see these as bonus tracks. I think it's um, a tragedy to have to limit it to seven and to really think about, you know, what everybody has in front of them in terms of my work and my person you know, but, um, but I'm also realizing that there's, um, there's a certain kind of, of, of rebuilding and uh, disassembling that needs to happen in my own, my own practice. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's interesting. I, I hadn't really uh, realized, but your last example, well, no, I guess Leonard Cohen's 2009, but there is a sense in which most of the most of your examples are pre, very pre-internet, and yes. and I mean it's not surprising in the sense of I mean we're the similar age, so in terms of when like formative things kind of enter into one's own subconscious or conscious, you know, is is uh, happens to be a certain timeline in relation to like historical and technological timelines, but maybe we do number two, uh, which will be a kind of post-internet uh, essential uh, that uh, brings you right up to the present. It would be interesting to, to see what the kind of more, you know, a more recent, you know, less excavational version of the, you know, like a version of this would be. Um, we have run out of time. We've taken up a little bit of your, your kids' extra time. so. We're very grateful uh, to them. Um, we are very grateful to you, Michael, for your incredible generosity, your openness, for the exhibition that you, uh, you left here in, in, in Dubai, which is still up. Um, and uh, I wish you uh, and your family, everyone in Chicago, and I wish everyone um, who's still on uh, the other end of this Zoom um, a very good evening, a very good afternoon, a very good morning wherever you are, um, thank you so much. And I hope to meet for uh, the essential number three, which will be with uh, who I've no idea yet, but um, you know, Michael has, uh, has set the bar very high. So Michael, thank you so much. Thank you all. And thanks for staying and, and listening. And, and Shimon, as always, it's uh, a pleasure to engage with you. Thanks to everyone at Arch and Meal for making this happen. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye.